people can change their lives. Real estate is a great avenue. And even if the market takes a dip, it always comes back. Your bills are still paid because people still need a place to live. So yeah. I think it's the best business in the world, real estate investing. As an investor, you have to make sure to do your due diligence. Just because you're hiring a property management company, it doesn't mean that they are protecting the building the way they should be. And again, once again, you know, we'll talk often, whether it's our mentees or people who ask us to do property management, we'll ask them questions about, you know, what about this? And were you doing that? And they'll say, no, I didn't know about it. It's like, oh my gosh, like you've been putting your property, your building, your future, your kid's future, you know, that, that, that bucket that you've been working towards at risk because you didn't know what you didn't know. So you really have to make sure, do your research and you got to treat it. You know, you kind of said more or less said it, but you got to treat it like a business. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast, where you'll learn the path to free rent and financial freedom through real estate. Featuring your hosts, Brad Labrie and Drew Klingler. Hey everyone, real quick before we start the show, Brad wrote an amazing ebook that will teach you everything you need to know about house hacking and living rent free. To get a free copy, text house hack, all one word, to 22828. That's house hack, all one word, to 22828 to get your free copy. Welcome to House Hacking Success. Today we have Mel and Dave, the investor couple, on the show with us. We appreciate you coming on. Hey, uh, thanks for having us. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so you guys are a huge inspiration to us. But for those who don't know who you are, tell a little about your background, kind of what got you into real estate, and, uh, you know, what got you here today? Sure. Do you want to start? I always <laughs> start. Why don't you start this time? Yeah, well, you know what? Um, <laughs> Mel and I met in 2013. She had a triplex and she had a duplex. So talking about house hacking, that's probably the first one uh, that, that Melanie had done, right? She bought a single family dwelling and she house hacked it and made a, a unit in the basement, but went horribly wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was my yeah, yeah. mistake number one. Yeah. yeah, And then I had a single family dwelling, which I wish I would have bought. In, uh, but again, it was it's like 650 square feet. Um, and there's no basement, so there's no house hacking there. So that was my mistake. So you can't really do anything else with the house. But uh, yeah, we started off with that. And then we met, I had that. She had the two uh, multi-unit or multi-family units. And uh, we both decided that we wanted to yeah, keep growing. Keep so growing, yeah. yeah, so we we kept uh, we kept going and hit some roadblocks, of course, as, as people naturally do with real estate investing. You know, you get so many doors and then you don't have any money to, to keep growing or you've already refinanced all your properties and it's like, okay, well, what do you want to do? We want to keep growing. Yeah. Um, um, we have to do something different. And that's when we finally opened our eyes and, and our minds to creative financing. Cause we were very much, no, we're never going to do that. I, know. Um, I think we're just very, we, I think fear at the end of the day, yeah. it all, yeah. we were, it, it, you know, we were making excuses. It, it was it's introduced not, you know, to, it's it, too good to be true. And, like it was 2017 was the year we did the 12 and 12, right? 12 uh, multifamily in 12 months. But uh, the creative financing and leveraging and all that was introduced to us about probably two years ahead. Uh, before then, I mean, sorry, but just uh, we were like, oh, that sounds too good to be true. Or just again, scared. Legal? And, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Before we get into all the, uh, you know, creative financing and you guys are experts at that and we'll talk about that and you guys have a course that is is geared towards that and you guys talk a lot about 12 and 12. Um, let's first talk about, you talked about that that uh, first house hack where the basement went uh, completely wrong. Like we really appreciate those kind of stories. My first house, I lost everything in it. It was a disaster, you know, and, 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 and it happens, right? Like there's highs and there's lows in real estate. Talk a little about that scenario and then how you, you know, the mindset it takes to rebound from something like that and build what you guys have been able to build. Yeah, so it was, you know, it was a single dwelling. The basement was unfinished, so I thought I had this brilliant idea of, you know, house hacking it and putting a, uh, you know, a, 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 um, I think it was a one-bedroom downstairs. It was nice. Uh, it was really nice, like nice finishing, Fire beautiful place. kitchen. Yeah. Like, it looked beautiful. So I was really happy. Everything was going well. It was cash flowing. Like, it was perfect. Until, you know, knock, 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 the city comes knocking on the door because it's an illegal duplex it wasn't zoned and i didn't mean you know back then i you don't know what you don't know i didn't yeah. know i couldn't do it i didn't do it on purpose so then it's like no no you guys have an illegal um you know apartment downstairs and i think it, be, it 
it came about because we wanted to refinance that place, right? That's how they kind of got flagged. Yeah, well, it, it was finally, you know, you you do you put the work in, it finally comes to fruition, the rents are high. Okay, let's bring it back to the bank, refinance it, take our money out and go do the next one. So the appraiser walks through, everything's good. When the appraiser called the city to verify the zoning and the legal use of the building, um, turns out that it's a single family dwelling and then tells the city, well, they're using it as a duplex. So that's illegal. They said, yep, okay. So he puts it in his report. You know, we think nothing of it. And then a week later, the city comes knocking saying, we have reports of a duplex. And uh, so, and and we tried guys, like the last case in it, the, the worst case scenario was selling the property, which we ended up doing, but like we begged and pleaded with zoning. Can we get a change? Can, what can we do? And yeah, they said, how is there? yeah, and we couldn't. And they said, you can apply. That. You can always apply to everything. But they said, you know, don't, don't waste don't your time, waste your time guys, more so. or less. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so we ended up having to uh, notify the downstairs tenants. They moved. And they were great they tenants. They were great. You know, we were sad to leave them going. And I feel bad, too, because it was but they, know, something But they actually that... moved in. Uh, Corey ended up moving into another unit. So, yeah, so we kind of made it a win-win, right? We said, oh, sorry, <laughs> this happens. you got to move out. But here's a solution for you. If you want another place, we'd love to keep you as a tenant. And, yeah, she did. Um, so she moved into one of our other rentals. So, you know, for that, it, it did work out. And we ended up selling. And we didn't lose tons of money. Like, we didn't lose money. We ended up, but I didn't, my plan wasn't to sell it. I wanted to hold it. Yeah. It was, you know, it was a nice little place. But anyhow, so that was my first so experience. check your zoning before you decide yeah. to do it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You do check the allowable yeah. usages and all that, yeah. yeah. So, so fast forward, you guys own 24 buildings, over 100 units, um, from my understanding. What do you guys, you know, so you guys are seasoned, you know what you're talking about, you have courses, you're, you're experts in the industry. What do you guys now relay to newbies, new, you know, beginners, a lot of people that are listening to this show? What are the, what are the uh, first advice you would give to someone uh, just starting out? Yeah, and I think, I mean, part of it is that that's part of the thing, right? Just like I didn't know what I didn't know, there's so much unknown. That's where it's so important to, you know, to seek out for, for advice so you can get structured from the, you know, <laughs> your business structure, your due diligence, your risk, all that kind of stuff. So um, just being able to, to know what you don't know. So that way at the end, you're going to save thousands of dollars in mistakes and, and fast forward your growth. Exactly. And, and again, not to, you know, go back to that example, but okay, we didn't lose any money. We didn't make a ton of money, but the plan didn't go as we wanted. So we lost time, which you can never get back. Right. So just knowing those things ahead of time. And again, you know, you're going to make mistakes and that helps you learn, but you can't get time back. So that would be, that was like a six month project, let's say, yeah. uh, from start to finish from selling and everything, buying and selling and flipping or um, renovating, I mean. That's a lot of properties I could have bought in that time, right? <laughs> exactly. So like, and the other thing I would tell uh, beginners is, um, oh, you, you kind of touched on it, now I'm drawing a blank. But it was uh, like you had said, you don't know what you don't know. And again, like Mel said, structuring, structuring yourself from the beginning. Like at one point we, we had bought in the 12 and 12 and then we found out that like we had about six, even six buildings before uh, the 2017, 12 and 12. And all of a sudden we had 18 buildings um, at the end of 2017 and we were not structured properly. And then it was playing, you know, catch up with that, right? With the accounting, with the, the legal think, aspect, the structure. You know, so thousands and thousands. So we, had, we, did it, thousands. we kind of did it at the tail end of it after having 18 yeah. buildings. And it's like, hey, now it's not the time to structure yourself. No. Right. I think right. that means, you know, we didn't give up. And, and yes, we hit roadblocks. And yes, we made very costly mistakes. And I wish I would have you know, learned, learned this stuff sooner. Um, but we also didn't give up, right? So, okay, this is a roadblock. Let's move along. Let's fix it. Let's keep yeah. going forward. So right. we never, you know, we never gave up on it either because it, it certainly ne is never perfect. Um, you know, there's going to be challenges no matter what, if you can help reduce the amount of bears and fantastic. Um, but, but, you know, you have to have that drive and, you know, and, that force behind you. And, and you know, what's kind of, no, it's funny now, it wasn't funny at the time, but what's kind of funny now is when we're talking to people in our course or different investors in that, and they're saying, should I do this? You know, and we're like, okay, please listen to me. Uh, we did it the hard way. We had to restructure 18 buildings into corporations, into accounting molds, like, don't like, we know what we're talking about we're not making we're not pulling this out of the air guys we're making it up so in the end it kind of i shouldn't say it helps our credibility with people that we're helping out but it's like we've been there done that we made a huge mistake don't do this right yeah. so yeah looking back it's not, it's not that bad but it wasn't funny then i think that's so part, our... right is, is when you're going through, sorry when, <laughs> we just want to touch on that. when you're going through stuff uh it's always seems worse right so when i when i had that first place and then i found out that it was illegal like 
I was so upset. It was, like, it was devastating because, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, first of all, why did I do that? Why did I not know? Why did I do my due diligence? You know, that self kind of blame. And then, okay, what do we do about it now? And it's going to cost us money. And, right. But it, once you get through those things now, I mean, now we do our due diligence. So that wouldn't happen, happen again. But when we do hit different roadblocks, you know, if you have a tenant that messes your place, it's like, all right, well, it's not fun, but let's just deal with it and move, move along. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so what are ways that people could be proactive about making sure that they're structured instead of, you know, doing it later? So what can they look into? How can, what research can they do? Stuff like that. Uh, absolutely. And honestly, we had talked to, and that's, uh, it's, sorry, I'm going to backtrack here. We had talked to about two to three lawyers and two to three accountants. And when we had the six, they said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, don't, don't do corporations. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're not going to lose everything in accounting wise. You're not going to save any money. And, so they were, you know, but then all of a sudden when we, when we bought the 12 and 12 and now we go back to them with 18 and they're looking at us like, what is wrong with you guys? What are you doing? You know, you need to do this and this. I'm like, we just talked to you a year ago and you said we were fine. <laughs> but then they were like, well, I didn't think you'd go buy 12 properties in, in a year. So what I would tell people is if you're going, and again, I'm not a lawyer, not an accountant. Our lawyers wants us to say that legal disclaimer, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, if you're going to be doing this, you know, if it's a side hustle, you want to do one or two accounts and lawyers say don't worry about it but if you want to and i'm talking like if i could go back and tell dave this in time i would say dave get into corporations go see real estate investor focused uh accountants and lawyers and tell them here's my goal you know i want to own 10 properties one day and blah 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 you know and they'll get you set up the way you should be and then it's just not having to go back on what you've done and redo it properly like, there's so many different ways of doing it as well which one's right for you right so there's and I mean, you, you can't explain it in five minutes. There's just so much to know. And, and, and that's where you really got to make sure to do your due diligence. Yeah. So that's what I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, let's, let's speak to financing a little bit, right? Let's uh, we'll categorize it, categorize it into two sections um, sort of as house hackers, it's primary residence, right? So, uh, you know, you know, FHA, there's extensions for renovation loans and I've done some of them. A lot of people bring on show, do things like that. Uh, so we can talk a little about that financing for newbies uh, on a primary residence, trying to maybe do house yeah. hacking like you did, uh, where they actually get into zoning, you know, correct zoning and things of that nature. Then also into the investors, people that may be on the show that are listening that are house hackers and they're looking to take it to the next level. Um, talk to maybe both sides of the financing spectrum and then, you know, the creative financing that you guys do. Yeah. And the FHA, um, like I, I, one of our mentees is in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And that was one of his plans was he was going to, can't you get in at like 3% or something or 3.5? Yeah. 3.5. Okay. Um, and, and that was his plan. And, and at first I was like, you know what? No, no, go to multifamily. And, and when we really talked it out, he was explaining to me, he's like, Dave, I'm going to move my family into it. I'm going to house hack it. Um, uh, great guy. Great, great. Uh, uh, sorry. In the end, I, I agreed with him. Like, this is a great decision. You're going to move in 3.5% down. How can you beat that? Like, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, like that's anyway and then with the interest rates uh it's almost free money nowadays but anyway so you move into it you renovate it as long as you do it properly do your due diligence call the zoning call the head of them say if i was to do this at this property uh you know what does it entail like just do like people... and and with that fha loan and, and almost all these loans now especially for primary residents they they have extensions which they're rehab loans, right? So you actually put 3% on the total. It's not, you don't even have to put an additional 3%. And so for instance, I bought a four unit with an FHA. It's the 203K, which is the extension for the renovation, right? And we appreciate the property by 130 plus thousand, um, you know, but in putting 3% down, which is kind of the unique situation for people just getting started with house hacking, right? As a 20 something or a newbie, it might be difficult to come up with a 20% down, sometimes needed, you know, the, that barrier to entry to buy an investment property. Uh, getting started that way now now speak to maybe the creative situations you do for investors um that don't need to be primary residences yeah and, and that like that's be that's really our bread and butter is the creative financing again because yeah. two percent com coming up with 20 percent is a lot of money right 3.5 there's 5, no way like there's no way we would have bought 12 properties in 12 months it's not like we didn't come from a rich background we had a yeah, good job but it's, but it's not like we had tons of money coming we're still living paycheck to paycheck um so yeah the creative financing was our key to, Game to growth. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it was just finding those, those ways, like owner financing and seller financing, like owner financing, seller financing or vendor take back everyone, whatever, whatever you want to call it, where, where yeah. the owner or the seller participates in financing the building for you. 
that is the most beautiful thing in the world. Other than that 3.5 FHA, which yeah, I'm jealous pretty, of. That's pretty sexy too. <laughs> we don't sure. we don't have 3.5 here yeah. in Canada, but um, no, I'm I'm that's amazing. And and when when the owner or seller can participate, and either or, right? Like if they have the building fully paid off and they're willing to hold the first mortgage for you, which is going to be the lion's share of the financing, like that. I've got two deals right now where they're both going to be holding a um, million dollars on the first mortgage. And that's the owner. That's the seller. Dave, I'm going to hold a million dollars for you. Like, that's incredible, right? And then I've got to come up with a down payment of, you know, 20, 25% of the purchase price. Yeah. And then vice versa. Sometimes like the 12th and 12 was mostly, and, and this is important, is finding those financial institutions, you know, the brokers, the credit unions that are okay with creative financing. And once I found a credit union that said, yes, Dave, as long as the deal makes sense, as long as the ratios make sense, you can have a second in behind our mortgage, as long as the cash flow is still there and you're still meet your ratio. So once we found that bank uh, and we found owners that were willing to hold 25% back on a vendor take back on closing, it was, it was game changer. So and that's sort of a mindset shift there. You just kind of talked about it without even, you know, you know this, but you you begin to partner with banks, right? You actually go and tell them their plans where a lot of people kind of get into it and they feel like the banks may be their uh, enemy rather than their friend and their partner, right? Like they they, they try to hide things. Uh, not necessarily that you hit things, but like, you, you know, people go into areas and try to rezone them themselves without letting the city know or, you know, things like that. Like yeah. going to cities and asking where you can go to, you know, get rezoning or going to banks to say, how can I do this? Like that, those are the ways that you can be creative. And a lot of people don't realize that I feel like. And, and, and sorry, Mel, I just want to finish up on the bank thing. Um, no, you're, that's, that's exactly true. And I, that bank has been so amazing to me that can I go and get a better entry interest rate somewhere else? Absolutely. But it's not about saving and, and people will argue with me, maybe a couple hundred dollars every month on a property. If I got a better interest rate overall, my portfolio, yes, that comes a lot of money. However, they let me do not whatever I want, but they let me get so creative with deals that I know, I know if the deal makes sense, I don't have to, I don't have to convince them. I don't have to explain to them. I don't have to say, this is how I do business. They just understand the overall picture. They understand the life cycle of the deals and they know I'm going to pay back the second uh, or the, the creative financing and have 20% equity once I bring it up with my lift. So they get that. So whether they, you know, if I could, I go out and get 3.85%. Yeah. yeah. But they charge me, you know, four, eight, four point eight five, sometimes 5% if it's bigger commercial and the higher interest is just worth the fact that they work with me, they get me and I don't have to go looking I think around. It comes right? down to, okay. So obviously there's return on investment, but return on time. Right. So, that return on time that we're getting by knowing that it's, you know, it's doable, it's easy, here it is, here's the information. We, you know, it's a win-win, we, we don't hide anything, we're very transparent, um, but yeah. it's that return on time. We don't have to worry about scrambling and trying to go to somebody else and then scrambling and trying to go to somebody else and always, you know what, yeah, we could save a couple hundred dollars, but during that time that we are trying to do that, we're closing on our next couple deals. So, and how much is that, right? The return on, on that is, is endless. So. Uh, that's how we, yeah, I guess, ultimately try to kind of. It's bigger see, picture. Bigger picture, and, and again, that win-win between everybody has to win. That's always our philosophy. So we have to win, of course, as investors. The private lender or the owner finance has to win. The bank involved has, like, everybody has to win. If somebody's not winning, we shouldn't be doing the deal because that's going to be the last yeah. deal to do with that person. And most landlords have more than one property, right? So <laughs> yeah. Let, let's dive deeper into the uh, seller financing, owner financing, land contract. There's a lot of different terms for it, but essentially all it is is whoever owns the property is just holding note for you. They become the mortgage uh, company instead of going to a bank. Let's talk a little bit deeper because a lot of the objections that people have with that, I personally have used it. I love it. Big fan of it. A lot of the objections are like, why would anybody want to do that for me? Like, who, you know, like, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would they, why wouldn't they just want to get cashed out or, you know, whatever the objections are, how do you approach people about seller financing and how would you advise people? I'm sure you advise people within your course. I'm sure you have, you know, something within it. How do you teach people to approach people about seller financing? Yeah. And I mean, a, a quick answer for that is kind of put yourself in their shoes, you know? So if you were the seller, what would you want to hear? I know what I would want to hear if I'm the seller and I'm going to lend to you, for example, well, I need to know certain things, right? I need to know, A, how much money am I going to make? What's the incentive for me? How do I know that you're going to pay me back? And, you know, for those kind of things, like for us, example, we always go in with our cash flow matrix. It shows the now, it shows what they're making, but it also shows the exit strategy. 
Um, and when I say exit strategy, that essentially means how am I going to pay them back? So if it's a five year term, how am I going to pay them back? And it's black and white. It's there. Everybody can see it. You know, they can actually look at it. They'll take it. They can show their account. And like, it just, it just makes sense because it's, it's black and white. It's numbers. And, so really explaining yeah. that exit strategy. Is and just to touch on two things that Mel said, the exit strategy, uh, we always say exit before you enter a deal. Um, there's lots of deals where owner financing is available and we could get into the building. It'll cash flow, but I can't lift the building enough to pay that person out. Therefore, I don't see my exit. So I don't even enter the deal initially. So we turn away a lot of deals that have owner financing because I don't want to get up, you know, what Creek and not be able to pay them back at the three or five year mark, whatever we've decided. And the other thing too, um, is the cash flow matrix. So that being said, we underwrite the deals like the bank does. So like the building we're standing in right now, it's our, it's our office on the main floor and there's two tenants above us, uh, residential. This building uh, was on the market for like eight months, building beside it as well as a fiveplex was on the market for eight months. Wouldn't sell, wouldn't sell, wouldn't sell. We looked at it initially, there was no owner financing. Okay, it didn't make sense. We looked at it again, eight or 10 months later, I forget the timeline. We saw the potential, right? The deal was here. We saw how we're going to bring it here. Explaining to the owner, okay, here's the matrix. Here are your numbers. It's not Mel and Dave. Your building doesn't make sense. If you want that asking price or, or roughly close to it, the ratios aren't there. The bank is not going to approve it. It doesn't underwrite. Like it's not us. It's not, so, yeah, you can. It can be whatever. Unless someone comes with Larry uh, 50%, and Linda coming in, yeah. it's going to be the same kind of situation. Yeah, unless someone comes in with like a fifty percent down payment, but they're buying almost half cash. So explaining that to the owner and saying, "Hey, hold the first. Like this is what we did in this exact building. Hold the first mortgage of eighty percent loan to value, and then we had a, a, an investor hold the the secondary or the the second mortgage, which is you know, uh, set, what, second mortgage." Let us get it up and, you know, get the rents up, do a little bit of TLC. That way the ratios will work. We'll bring it to the bank in a year from now. We'll kick you out. We'll have gotten the building up and then we'll have a zero down asset. So it's, it's being able to see past the numbers and talking with the owners. Your building doesn't work right now. Like it's not being mean. It, it, it's being personable as well. Like just, and these owners, you're really providing them, like you're extending an olive branch. They wouldn't be able to sell at the price that they want to, you know, the way it is. So by you going in and offering to uh, help, it, honestly, you're helping them with owner financing. I know it sounds weird and people don't believe it, but they didn't have an exit strategy. They didn't have succession planning. A lot of people have a building where their spouse died and they're like, Dave, I, I wasn't the real estate person. I want out of this now. And then you're just, you're helping them by helping with owner financing. Give me a year or two to bring it up. I'll bring yeah. it to the bank. You'll make interest on your money. You'll feel, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll help your tax situation. It's a win, win, win. So, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure the specific rules in uh, where you are, but here in uh, here in the States, there are a lot of, of tax benefits to seller financing. And like I said, I, I have done it. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I've gotten a lot of help from my accountant in in persuading people into, you know, seller financing. Uh, speak a little bit to that, like, because, again, it's so hard for newbies to wrap their mind around the fact that somebody wouldn't want their money right now and that they would only want, you know, four or five, six percent interest. Uh, but there are a lot of incentives, a lot of incentives for people to do uh, owner financing. Uh, like, what are those tax benefits? It's, it's so interesting. They always we always talk this, over each other. Yeah, no. and then, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and we hear this all the time. People are saying, you know, oh, you know, why would they want to do that? This is, it's not doable. You know, you're just, are you ripping them off? And it's like, no, like, you don't understand. We, like, people are so grateful. Uh, you know, at the end, when we close the deal, I'm like, thank you so much for doing this with me. And, you know, especially when we, we pay them back, Hey, thank you. Let's do it all over again. But absolutely. There's so many, you know, there is essentially, like Dave said, quite often, they may not have an exit strategy or quite often they weren't even really thinking about selling. And all of a sudden Mel and Dave are at the door saying, Hey, we're interested in buying your property. Have you considered it? And they may say yes or no. And, you know, maybe a month or two, they call us back and said, you know what, something's happening. My my wife's not feeling well. She's really ill. I need to be hands off. You know, can you help me out here? And I'm like, absolutely. You know, let, let's, let's make it a win-win here and, and let's figure out something. So it's really get, ask questions, get to know what's important to them. Right. And maybe they're not, a, and not everyone's going to be um, willing to hold it, but there are a lot of people that are, and you're going to get a whole whack of no's, right? So if you get five no's, then go ask another five and you get 10 no's exactly. and go ask another 10, right? So keep asking. Um, you have to make sure that you articulate with the benefits and all that kind of stuff to them. And really, how do you know the benefits? You got to ask them the right questions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So, uh, so we'll transition a little bit more to, uh, you know, like investors specifically trying to raise, you talked a little bit about private money covering, um, you know, the second mortgage, right? You get a, you get a land contract or, or seller financing. Uh, how do you approach people with that second mortgage the you know, the 20% or 25% you need, or maybe more if you need reserves and things of that nature? Uh, how do you approach that? How do you structure that? And, you know, how do you teach people in your course uh, to, to raise that, that secondary money? Yeah, great question. Um, and I'll use, okay, so here in Canada, it's called RRSP, uh, Registered Retirement Saving Plan. Same thing as a 401k or Roth IRA for you guys, right? Uh, and, and, and you guys in the States can do the same thing. So you can use, like, and I'll use this building as an example. I used a lady's RRSP um, to, to fund my second mortgage. So because it's a secured and registered fund, it has to be secured or registered against a, a building uh, in the form of a mortgage. So I approach this lady, she's making, well, right now the market is a bull market, right? And the stock market is high, but it's not always like that. So, but it, this lady wasn't making good returns on her and her money in her RSP or her, her, uh, her uh, registered retirement saving plan. So I tell her, okay, she self directs it and then gives it to us. Well, not give it to us. It, the lawyers do everything. She puts a second mortgage on the building, which in turn ends up becoming our down payment. Um, so when we sold this building, the owner didn't get the first mortgage, right? Because on closing, he's holding that. He got the second mortgage amount, so 20% of the purchase price from the registered uh, savings. And then now she has a mortgage on the building. So why is it important for her? If she's making, I don't know, 4% in her, in her, in her um, 401k, IRA, or RSP, and you're offering her eight or 10, you know, on the second mortgage, to them, it's a, it's a no brainer, right? And, and the, every deal depends how much interest you can pay, what the deal can support, but it, it's really approaching them. And again, they're secure. They're in, they have a mortgage on a building. It's not just. Yeah. And let me clarify, because a lot of people misunderstand this piece. So they have a second, they don't own the property. The property is owned solely by Melanie and Dave. All our 24 buildings are right. owned solely by Melanie and Dave. So it's not a joint venture type of thing. It's just the mortgage. So it's just how the transaction of, of the cash is done. So she's secured on it, but it's still under our name, which means we get to keep 100% of the profit of the appreciation of all that, you know, all that cash flow. But she just has a, uh, like on title, she's registered as a mortgage, mortgagee, mortgager. I always forget the wording there, but um, it's like a bank. It's, it's like the bank asking for a mortgage from the bank. So uh, that that's attractive to a lot of people. You're paying them more interest. They have a mortgage on a building. If Mel and Dave don't pay, they foreclose on the building. They close it. The, the first gets paid out and the second gets the remaining or they have the option to take the building over. So it's a very, very attractive way for people to invest their money. And what I like is it seems like, well, not everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people want to invest in real estate, right? Because real estate's the hot thing. Everyone, you know, everyone's seeing people uh, building wealth and, and, and becoming millionaires. So like Mrs. RSP, what I call her, or Mrs. IRA or Mrs. 401k, um, she's investing into real estate without having to deal with the issues of landlording through this, through us. So it, it's, it's, it's. Yeah. Cool and, to, and to your point, I mean, uh, you know, first of all, the four, you know, uh, the stock market in general is, is sort of a casino. Uh, and so when people get to <laughs> to older age, right, they generally switch to, to the bond market. Right. And so when you switch to the bond market, you're talking about one and a half, two percent returns. Right. And, and so and so when you invest through someone like you in real estate, you're generally just as secure. You guys have a track record. Uh, you guys have great records of, of what cash flow is going to be. You have, you know, every, like you said, black and white, everything's black and white for her. She she maybe doubles or triples what her returns would be in the bond market. And as just as uh, as safe, you know, with you as she would be in the bond market or something like that. And that's a big selling point. Yes. And, and honestly, guys, um, you know, no, great point. That, that's that, that, that's exactly what happens. Um, oh, what was I going to say to touch on that? Um, oh, I forgot it again. I think you were going to say, <laughs> so, so let, let me, ask, let me ask you this then just to the further that, uh, because we talk a lot about reserves on properties, right? Like, yeah. you know, at, at being house, being house hackers, maybe initially we don't need it, but building up reserves at some point is important. And I'm sure you guys agree with that. Uh, with your properties, are you, you know, when you, when you get someone to uh, private, you know, pr lend you the money for the 20 or 25%, is that also, are you going to uh, borrow more to cover reserves or do you come out of pocket with that? Or how do you guys usually structure something like that? And this is why we love using OPM, other people's money is like, we have line of credits, we have cash. So that is our contingency. That is our what if plan, right? We um, have equity in other buildings. You know, there's a lot of different 
what ifs like what if this isn't what if it takes us longer to flip the place right how are we going to pay them back so yeah we're set up that if plan a doesn't go through we have a plan b and if he does so so yeah so people come to us quite often and say i want to take your program i have zero money to invest though or and i have you know i have zero it's like well i can't i don't want to train you yet i don't want to help you yet because i want to set you up for success exactly great point you need that kind of money because guess what if, if a tenant moves in and they don't pay months pay uh, rent for three four months and depending of which you know what state you live in or um which province well then what happens right what's your contingency plan you need that kind of cash as a backup so i'm going to teach you how to use other people's money so you can keep buying properties but yeah absolutely you should have a certain amount and as you grow your portfolio that amount of course should be if you're doing it properly <laughs> should continue to be larger and larger right so and okay and uh I forgot about the thing. It was the the exchange rate between the states and you and, uh, and Canada. Mm-hmm. People have no idea, and I blows my mind. So, but uh, to touch on what Mel's saying, that's what I forgot earlier. <laughs> to touch on what Mel's saying is, um, it's so much easier for us to get money through mortgages, either first or second mortgages, because people feel safe and secure because it's in a mortgage. It's you know, now if something happens and then we have to go to someone after and say, hey, contingency plan, I need more money, please, because I've used you know, let's say if I would have used my money as the twenty percent down payment. And then something goes, you know, we take a left turn somewhere. We need more money. That's that's a harder ask from people to say, you know, fund my my miscalculation on my reno. So I like to get OPM to purchase the building. Then I have our money for the contingency plan. If something goes wrong, we fund the the mishap and the renovation because the line of credit is there. The money's there that we've saved up. It's just easier and I don't have to convince people. Mortgages, they're secured. They're, they're happy with that. So that's what I like about that aspect of it. We keep our money for the what ifs. And when there's what ifs, I go to line of credit, I take it and I go out now and I don't have to explain to anyone. Um, and then also to touch on people with IRAs and Roth IRAs, because we, we deal with the like California and again, Atlanta and Florida and all that stuff, guys. Uh, who else do we have? Utah, Miami. Utah, oh. and Washington, Seattle. Anyway, so we have a lot of mentees that are from the States as well, because it's pretty cool. There's, you guys have better tax advantages than us, but there's there's other things. Yeah, that are we, pretty and similar. we cover the difference, but overall the concept of OPM is more or less the same. And if there's when there's differences, we'll cover that. But yeah, and what I wanted to say is when I talk to the mentees in the states, I'm like, guys, your dollar, it, like to get a Canadian dollar, you have to pay seventy cents. And, and they're like, really? And I'm like, yes. So if ever you wanted to bring your money and invest it in Canada, think you give me seventy thousand dollars, and you've just made a hundred thousand dollar investment here. So that like the exchange is just you know for, for you guys amazing for us when i go to florida on holidays it's not the best but <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff it's always an extra expensive trip for us yeah year, i give them a thousand bucks and i get 700 back i'm like this wasn't fair but um <laughs> but anyway that's not just like but they knowing that and then when, when i talk to the american folks and i tell them that they're like what i thought it was just dollar for dollar no 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 your dollar's worth so much more here and i've already talked to the accounts and i said what if someone invests or when someone invests from the states how does it work and I issue a T5 from Canada to them for their taxes. So it's very simple, guys, and your money is worth a lot more than ours. So just food for thought when I when I talk to our American friends. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, it's something I hadn't considered. I knew the exchange rate, but I didn't know it was that uh, drastic, you know, 30%. Yeah, and, and don't I, quote me on that. No, Who knows and I think we notice it more because for us, when we go there, it's yeah, always that. It hurts. Right? It hurts yeah, a little bit yeah. more. But yeah, absolutely. We're, we're from Michigan, so we, we, you know, go over the border every now and again. And so I just did, I was, you know, but not that often, not often enough to realize it was that big of a difference. <laughs> so so speaking to, uh, you know, again, kind of going back to our base here of, of the newbie investors, um, you know, we've, we've got touched on financing. Uh, now maybe now maybe transitioning towards like, you know, property management and and the things maybe after purchasing a property. What would you uh, speak to the the audience about? What, what would you like them to know? <laughs> we, we both want to go around. I, <laughs> All right, go first. I just have a point. It's, okay. not, it's not even, I just see so many people who are investors, like finding the deal is fun, you know, getting it under contract, financing it, all that stuff is fun. And then when it comes to the tenant relation, like that's only the, that's only the tip of the iceberg is finding deals in that. Like once you have the asset, the people you're putting into this asset who are paying the bills and paying you cash flow every month, like that, that is, that's going to continue going on. Like they just, I, I find they find, they spend too much time on that aspect of finding it, not enough on how to manage it after and to get your money's worth and to continue, you know, you got to keep the engine going, you got to keep the machine going. So exactly. And whether you're doing it yourself or you're getting somebody else to manage and, and for Dave and I, we did it ourselves for years. Then we, you know, we have, we have our team now that oversees our 
buildings. And we also have our team that oversees anybody else that invests in our city. We have a property management company here. Um, but what we see, like, so as an investor, you have to make sure to do your due diligence. Just because you're hiring a property management company, it doesn't mean that they are protecting the building the way they should be. And again, once again, you know, we'll talk often, whether it's our mentees or people who ask us to do their property management, we'll ask them questions about, you know, what about this? And were you doing that? And they'll say, no, I didn't know about it. It's like, oh my gosh, like you've been putting your property, your building, your future, your kid's future, you know, that, that, that bucket that you've been working towards at risk because you didn't know what you didn't know. So you really have to make sure, do your research and you got to treat it, you know, you kind of said more or less said it, but you got to treat it like a business. It's a business mm -hmm. just because you own it now doesn't mean you can just go wash your hands. You can certainly be hands off, you know, we're in a way we're hands off. We, you know, we don't take the tenants call. We don't do the viewings anymore. We're hands off, but I still know what's happening with my buildings overall, right? I still get reports every month. I know what vacancy rate and all that kind of stuff. So you still need to be educated on what's going on um, with your property. And most importantly, make sure that you have the proper type of, uh, of security or, or, yeah. or insurance. It's liability. All that kind like, of stuff, that liability. liability. And, and now, again, I'm just going to reiterate, if you treat it like a business, if you're a real estate investor, treat this like if you were going to buy a restaurant, you wouldn't just, well, I'll be a chef now. No, you wouldn't just do that. So treat it like anything else you would do. Uh, real estate is no different. And if you do it that way and you, and you take every step to, to, to analyze and make it a business process, you'll be successful. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things about house hacking too, is it puts you in that property and it forces you to learn how to become a property manager. So yeah. we're learning, you know, it's, it's right there next door. So it's a lot easier, but you're learning the inner workings. It's kind of like having training wheels for property management. And like me and Brad, like manage properties, but you know, maybe five years down the road, I don't want to manage them anymore, but I'm going to know what to look for in a property manager because I've built up that experience. Exactly. exactly. And you that's priceless. That's priceless. Knowing what questions to ask, right? So Okay, if you're going to hire somebody, you need to know this and this and this. And the only reason you'll know that is because you've done it for how many years, right? And you've seen it all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So like what kind of characteristics specifically do you look for in uh, property managers? So I'm I'm over the top on like legal stuff and accounting. Like that's like we're so layered up with our corporations and that. Like and then when we have our mentorship course, like I show them. We're like a onion, right? Yeah. Layer, 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 layer. layer, layer. layer, layer. <laughs> So, so I'm over the top with that. So when I'm talking to a property manager, like I'm, uh, how much insurance do you have? How much insurance am I named in your, like all these things where I've asked my insurance company, what do I need? Uh, sorry, let me backtrack there, Drew. Like the way I look at it is if ever I end up in court or if ever I have something where I need insurance, have I done every reasonable, have I taken every reasonable step and done my due diligence so that the insurance cannot deny my claim, right? Have I done everything where they could say, yes, Dave, you're, you're not at fault here. And it, it, if I got to say in front of a judge in court, can I say that I've done my due diligence to avoid any, um, you know, legal action or something like that. So that's my mentality with everything. So when I talk to the property manager, I want to see what their stance is, what their, what their setup is, you know, if something goes sour, um, how does that look? How are you protected? How are we protected? How are you ensuring that this doesn't get to that point? So for me, that's, that's my, cause I, I'm always, no one's ever going to take my house away from my kids and, and, you know, from us. So that's my whole, that's my why, because <laughs> I want the, the kids safe and, and Mel, obviously. So that's what I, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's so, so I go into it looking, you know, we're not going to, you know, mess this up and then let's, let's work it together so that we're, we're structured and secure. What do you know? What do you look for? In the, but I'm over the top on that. Yeah, and for me, it'd be you know, I'd want to just ask as many questions, right? At what kind of de tenants? What, what are you putting into? What what kind of screening are you do? What's your screening look like? All that kind of stuff, right? Because at the end of the day, that tenant that is going to be in your building is uh, can make or break you know quite a bit for you, <laughs> literally, right? If they trash your place or they don't pay months for or rent for how many months, right? It's that you're talking thousands of dollars. It's a thousands of dollars decision. Mm -hmm. You want, and I mean, no matter what, it's going to happen. We've done it. It's going to happen to everyone. At some point, you're going to have a bad tenant. Um, but are they minimizing the risk, or are they just trying to get the places rented? And and what's the reviews, right? Google them. Are they? I mean, as a landlord, let's be realistic. It's pretty hard <laughs> to get you know a five star reviews when it comes to because you kick out <laughs> and guess what the tenant does. <laughs> yeah, one star. <laughs> But overall, right? I mean, overall, what's the reviews saying about them? And, uh, you know, that's going to go a long way. Absolutely. 
Awesome. Cool. So I just want to throw out like a hypothetical scenario. Like someone got, say, got into their first house hack. Uh, they're currently house hacking. But how do they know when they should expand, when they should go on to do another deal? Uh, maybe how should they know when they could go pursue like a zero down deal, uh, create a financing deal, like something like you do? Yeah. And honestly, um, I would just say, again, I love the house hacking thing. If I was to start over again, I would probably, my first one would be that house hack to get to know the ropes and all that. Um, and then I'm trying to think like if I was, if I was going to go to the next level, it would be, I would just, sorry, to go, like you said, Drew, you, you lived in the house, you are starting to get to know how to manage the property yourself. You're getting more comfort, you're getting more confidence in it. And then you start to think, well, I could probably do one where I don't need to live in it. And all the units are paying me money now because I'm not occupying one of them. Uh, and then once you kind of know what the numbers are, what, you know, Hey, that's that that's the countertop needs to get done. This needs to get painted underneath through the floor. Once you have the idea of how much your rentals are going to cost, just as you get more, um, not in the game, but more in tune with what things cost and what, how long things take, like everyone underestimates stuff. So once you get more comfortable with your numbers, uh, then you'll have more confidence to start talking to owners. Hey, would you do owner financing? I've got, I just house hacked. I, you know, I, I put, I bought it for X amount of dollars. I put something in the basement. I got X amount for rent every month. Now my building's worth this. I want to do the exact same with this building. Uh, and I've got the experience and I know how. So I think when you're at that point, you feel confident. But again, don't wait forever. Like there's always two sides to every story. Don't wait forever till you feel you know everything. That's that's not us at all. Right. We, as soon as we know about 80% of what we're doing, we jump in and we figure out the rest later. There's always going to be that fear to take this step, right? Every single time. Every single time we ever had a growth. You know, when we bought 12 in 12 months, we were both working full time. We have three kids at home and they're multifamily. They're over 50 units. Yeah, that, you know, six yeah of course we were scared. What, what are we doing? <laughs> we're buying a lot. People thought we were crazy. Our family was like, you guys, you guys should just calm down. <laughs> oh, no, this is fun. Oh, no. yeah. We're on a mission, right? We're on a mission to change but, our lives. And we did. Um, but of course, it's still, of course, there was still fear. But I think that drive, the determination of, of doing it, um, yeah. you know, push through that fear and, 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 and do it <laughs> as opposed to waiting for the perfect time. Yeah. So Drew, again, to kind of answer your question is instead of waiting, you know, if you have fear, don't let it cripple you. Don't let it stop you. Uh, fear is good. Like if you're, if you're thinking, oh, I can do what anything, you know, fear is good because it makes you have checks and balances and that, but don't, don't let it be the all, all encompassing thing. Break through it as well. Right. Awesome. I love that answer. You know, learning by doing is definitely the best way to learn. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I like to read books and, you know, people are probably doing that to prepare for all that. But if you're, reading that book while taking action, you're learning lessons at the same time. And it's a really good point. Um, so what are your uh, long-term goals in real estate? Well, we have, and I think we're about six months in, we have a goal. So we have over hundred units now. Uh, so we decided to 10 exit, right? So in five years, we wanted to have a thousand units. Um, and, and so that's really our goal. We want to have a thousand units, whether it's you know, all over Canada, all over the States. Uh, and, and people thought, you know, that's crazy, but, and it is, it is an amazing goal. And at the end of it, if we end up at five years with 800 units, I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm going to be super pumped still. Right. Uh, and what we ended up like, we're big on reverse engineering. So our goal is that, and then we can't just say I want a thousand and then, you know, in year four, we're like, Oh my gosh, we still need to buy 900 units. Like that's not the way to do it. So we just like, and Mel's good at that. She broke it down. Okay. We have five years, Dave, what are we going to do? So that's, divide this by five. So 900 divided by five and let's, you know, and also divide that by every six months. So biannually we need to get, what was it? 180, 180 units, every six months, yeah. every six months. And we're on track. So we're good. Yeah. We've got a bunch <laughs> of awesome. contract. We've got a bunch of refinances, which is slowing us up right now, but it's part of being a real estate investor. You need to refinance to, to recoup some, some other people's money. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that was well, um, Honestly, we've been loving, we started doing mentoring after we were in a, a, a car crash, it was a terrible crash. Um, you know, we almost died and we, we decided that we wanted to help other people attain financial freedom through real estate investing because it changed our lives, right? We were able to leave our job and all that. So um, I think that piece as well is, is something that like, we just love it. Like we love our group. We're in there every single day answering their questions. I want to continue to help people across, you know, across North America. I want to I keep doing it because the results are amazing. And every time somebody messaged me, Mel, I bought my other house or I bought my, yeah. you know, third property. <laughs> like I just love it. This gives me so much joy. Yeah. So I think for me, uh, yes, of course, I want to keep buying properties. 
but I, I want to kind of give back and help others attain that financial freedom piece that is so doable because it, it's it doable. is doable. It's different. not rocket science. You just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And that's the thing with the mentorship program. Like Mel says, it's been so unbelievably um, fulfilling. Like when someone messages you and says, Dave, I'm three weeks into your program and I just bought a duplex with none of my own money. Zero of my own it's money. It's like, that's amazing. And it's like, think of the trajectory, sorry, trajectory of their life. You know, they could have waited three years, but oh, I did it in three months. So now I'm on this path and then they're going to keep doing it. Like I just, people can change their lives. Real estate is a great avenue. And even if the market takes a dip, it always comes back. Your bills are still paid because people still need a place to live. So yeah. I think it's the best business in the world, real estate investing. Yeah. Well, what would you say separates uh, people from like people that want to become real estate investors versus people that actually are becoming one? I think honestly, and I see, I, it, I see it all the time. It's, the, it's the, oh, should I do it? And then fear sets in and, and I'm just going to do a bit more research or I'm just mm -hmm. going to wait a little bit longer. Or my mom's in the hospital. She's sick. I'm just going to wait. And, and, or, you know, my kids are young, and, you know, so, so they, they want it, but the fear of, of time, the fear of, of not being successful at it, the fear of whatever else is slowing them down is not doing it compared to people that are actually doing it. They still have the fear, but they say, oh, the timing's not perfect, you know, uh, but I'm going to do it anyways. And, and, and that's when they explode, right? It's the same with me. Like, I mean, things weren't going well. My dad had a heart attack that year. Like, they, you know, things, things happen and, and life and is not perfect and there's always going to be reasons not to do it you know i can always i can think of a thousand reasons not to do certain things right if you want to but i can also i think uh, remember my why which is, of course for us is, is the kids um you know that's a lot more important than my thousand excuses that i that i can make up yeah absolutely and and, and we see it so often i used to see it where i work like it's just people people love to chat about it people like the idea of it but taking that step it's scary and I, I with, without meeting now I wouldn't have taken the step either because I was very I was petrified I was being a big baby so like, <laughs> <laughs> right, it's I was so scared of these what is what is what is it's funny people always think it's reverse they yeah. all Dave was a big saver and I all, I'll, I'll let him <laughs> story yeah but but again um it was later becomes never I like I've seen it so many times no I'll start later it's just not the right time later always becomes never it's just i see I, I, it makes me sad like i see it where i talked to someone four years ago and i'm like yeah yeah i should do it and they're that close and they just don't and look it's become never it's four years later where are you now you should have you know, think of your trajectory how much it would have changed by then the other thing as well is it's never the right time it's never ever ever the right time um like i'm, I'm thinking back to when um when we were doing things again, Mel's dad had a heart attack, wasn't the right time. Mel was pregnant, wasn't the right time. We were moving. We had to live in one of our apartments at one point when she was pregnant because we were in between houses. Like, like I'm not saying it's all rosy and peachy. Like it just, it's never the right time. So just jump in now because you're, what's that saying? It's not the, it's not the market. Or it's not the timing of the market. It's time in the market. It's so true. Just buy some real estate, do your education or do your, your, your research piece first, but don't think it like get into it. Once you find a good place, get into it. And then, Hey, next, next thing, you know, two years later, three years later, the market is appreciated. If you would have waited, you would have missed out on that appreciation. Like it's time is money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a compound interest aspect to it. Oh. You know, wherever the market's at. So the yeah. earlier, the better. So That's get started. Right. People always say, Oh, I wish I would have started five years ago. Okay. Well, don't, well yeah. then don't wait another, don't five, wait another five. Yeah. 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 <laughs> five years. Start, now. start now. Okay. You regret that. Well, well, learn from your mistake. Let's they go. They <laughs> but they don't, right? So, got it again. Another five. So we always talk about uh, books on the show, and we like to hear people's uh, favorite books to recommend to our listeners. Uh, do you have any like mindset or business books that you would recommend? Yeah. Well, here, here comes the shameless plug. Uh, oh yeah, right here. This one here. So we'll, start, we'll start off with this one, right? Shameless plug. Not gonna lie. Um, I will. I will answer your question. But just FYI, we wrote a book, Amazon bestseller in multiple uh, fields. It's 88 pages. It's short for a reason. I hate reading books. I like audiobooks, so I couldn't be a hypocrite. Write a 300-page book that I would not read. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jordan, yeah. for me, honestly, um, I I loved um, Mindset. I, I love 10X from Grant Cardone. Yes. Um, I think that's when it got me thinking bigger because I used to have goals. I had a goal of having 10 properties by the time I was 40, and everybody told me yeah. that it was crazy. Like, everybody, yeah. why do you want to do that? Naysayers, you're not going to do it, or it's not doable. And and uh and now i have 24 buildings you know we got 24 before i turned 40 and uh and i think that 10x you know reaching setting those massive goals and 
at the end of the day, if, if like Dave said, instead of having a thousand units, if we're at 650 or 850 or whatever we end up being at, mm -hmm. ah, you know what? we're still way further ahead than if I would have said my goal is to be at 150, right? So um, that was my book that I would say. What about you? Yeah, me, well, Mel as well, like the, the 10X and the uh, Be Obsessed or Be Average, giving us the permission to be obsessed with it and just going out doing it. But the biggest mindset book that changed my life, like literally changed my life, was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. As soon as I read it, like it, I just, I still remember, like I changed, like it was so weird. Like I used to be in a job. We're in Florida. We're, we're in on Florida. vacation by the pool. Reading. We're actually we're reading. We're listening. Book, we don't, yeah. Yeah. I don't have the attention span to read. <laughs> um, we're in Orlando kissing me. We're doing the Disney trip with the kids. But again, still learning, still doing stuff. And I remember, because I used to be in a job where I could work overtime. So I would take every overtime shift I could do. No, I no, would, no, no. He like he was upset. Like he would sing. He'd get an overtime call and he'd start singing like, I love overtime. overtime. <laughs> I was obsessed with working overtime as yes. opposed to... But, yeah. and this is what... Okay, so let's talk about previous, Dave. Love working overtime. I was trading my time for money, okay? And when Robert Kiyosaki, when I listened to his book, and his first thing, his first rule was, the rich don't work for money. Like, it, it, it like broke my brain for a bit. Cause <laughs> like, I listened to the book, and at the end of it, I'm like, I've been, I've been doing this all wrong. Like, I just need to invest in, put the work in now into assets like real estate, real estate investing. Mm -hmm. And then once I once it gets rolling, it's like a tree. You plant it. The tree doesn't need you anymore. The real estate, like I could, we could not buy another piece of real estate today, and be live the life we want the rest of our lives. Give it to our kids and affect their lives and our grandkids. But again, I don't want to stop. But that's the beauty. We can, and that's what he designed. That's what he describes as well. This stopping the work and how long can you live without having to go get another job? So when I stopped trading my time for money, like Robert Kiyosaki taught, uh, taught us, it, it it changed our friggin' life, yeah, man. It was he, he no longer sings that song. I know I'm longer yeah. over time. Yeah. I don't, I don't <laughs> that song now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great book. It's a staple in, in the real estate investing uh, community. Uh, yeah. So so on that note, is there any real estate books that you would recommend or you've liked? Yeah, so that one for sure. Um, what's another real estate book we've read recently? Oh, there was some that I read really early on, and I wish I could remember them. Um, but it was just about stop making excuses. I, I read a lot of, because again, I'm, I'm big into accounting and then lawyer stuff. So I read like the, I forget what they were called. George, he's, he's Canadian. Uh, George Dubay, he's from BDO Accounting in uh, Guelph or Waterloo or something like that. He wrote like, a, it's like an accounting book for dummy or like accounting book 101. So that's, and again, that's at the beginning when I was really looking at, because I wanted to be a millionaire. And then when I started reading his books on accounting and real estate, I was like, I can legally not pay taxes and make a whole whack of money. Like <laughs> that was, you know, ding, 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 ding. So that book for real, like I, I would really look for real estate investors into the accounting and then legal structure of it because saving money, you know, making money, but also keeping it and saving it as opposed to giving it to the government is the, one of the most powerful things about real estate. Definitely. Definitely. Do you have one, Mel? You know? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> one. Me, I'm trying to think for me, it's, it's, I think it's just, it's not necessarily a book. I mean, yeah, a lot, there's a lot of great, yeah, or, or any uh, resource period. <laughs> You know, I, I love, I think it's mindset. Like I love having anything mindset, like Gary Vee, for example, you know, just oh, like, yeah. you know, once in a while, if I'm kind of feeling whatever negative or sorry for myself or whatever it is, it's like, you know, listen to something. And it's just that little tune up that I, that I need to kind of go, wait a second, I'm in control of my life. You know, mm -hmm. this happened because of me. So stop pointing the fingers, do something about it, move on. So I think, I think it's a lot of that. It's just, and it doesn't have to be, you know, hours of reading for me. Um, and maybe it is because I'm, you know, we have real estate, we have three kids, we have yeah, activities, just like a lot of people out there. Oh, I don't have time to read a book. Well, okay. But do you have, when you're doing your hair, do you have five minutes to put yeah. it on YouTube? And that's kind of what I do. It's just that little mindset in the morning, Tony Robbins, like whatever, there's always whatever time. person that you feel mm -hmm. that gets you uh, thinking positive, it just switches away. <laughs> and, think. and you're honest, I don't say this too often, but one of my pet peeves, we say it in our book is I dislike so much when someone says I don't have time and it just, do you watch TV? Well, then you have time. Yeah. You know, uh, like Mel and I used to wake up at 4 a.m. and go to bed late. So just make the time. Like there's time out there. You're just choosing not to utilize the time. So just, and I don't, and we, again, we say it in our book, uh, don't find excuses, just get it done. Find the time, get it done. It's going to change your life. Awesome. Amazing advice. Um, we really appreciate you coming on the show. You have an incredible story. I think it's going to be a huge inspiration to everyone listening. Um before I let you go, could you uh, let our listeners know where they could find out more about you? 
Yeah, so uh, there's Mel, yeah. Mel, Mel's the Mel's social, social media. Yeah, I usually point the camera at him, say say something, but then I'll post it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> two things I want to say. So the first one, we talked a lot about creative financing. If you want to find a bit more, just because again, it's I know it's hard to sneak all the information. We have a free masterclass. Yes. Um, it's www12. So the number twelve one two. In twelve in twelve months.com. Yeah, so twelve in twelve months.com. Okay. Um, so they can check that out. And also, otherwise, we're all over social media. So Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, all that. And our username is always, always Investor Mel Dave. Yeah, and we okay. try a lot of content. So if you we follow post, us, we're always trying to give some free content because we, we get it, right? Yeah. So we post daily. We go live at least once a week. Lately, we've been going live a lot. But uh, yeah, so we, we go live as well uh, quite often. Okay, cool. We'll put links to that into the description. Um, we'll also put a link to your book too and your course and everything so our listeners can go take a look and hopefully they'll follow your story as well. But uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show and I hope you have a great day. Yeah, yeah thank thanks, you. Thank you so much for you having very, us. You were very easy to talk to. So yeah, thank you we enjoyed time. it. Thank you. We okay, appreciate right. it. Okay, bye, bye for now. now. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to rate and subscribe. New episodes released every Wednesday and Friday.